there, and thanks for tuning in today. I'm Iris with Long Live the Kings, and today I'd like to share with you some of the things that we've learned through our work and our partners' work on the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project about an important topic for juvenile steelhead, predation. When one animal, a predator, kills and eats another, its prey, we call that interaction predation. And predation is, of course, common in all ecosystems. Every animal has to eat. But many of the predation dynamics within the Salish Sea, the shared waters of Puget Sound and the Strait of Georgia, are uniquely interesting because the Salish Sea is a unique ecosystem, different from other West Coast ecosystems by virtue of its very nature as a glacially formed inland sea and a complex biologically rich estuarine system. So today, we're gonna to focus in on a really interesting story, the story of predation impacts on juvenile steelhead within our home waters of Puget Sound. Steelhead are Washington state fish, and early estimates based on catch records and harvest estimates put Puget Sound abundance in the hundreds of thousands of fish around the turn of the century. By the 1980s, populations around Puget Sound had declined, with abundance estimates around 120,000, including hatchery production. And by the 1990s, Puget Sound run sizes were only around 45,000 fish. While populations across the Salish Sea have declined in abundance, Puget Sound populations exhibit the greatest change in abundance comparing 1980s to the 2000s. And this is due in part to a unique trend in survival within Puget Sound. The steelhead life cycle spans across many thousands of miles. These fish hatch from eggs that their parents laid in the gravel of a stream bed. They grow from those eggs into tiny little fish that then emerge from the gravel and make their home in the stream for a year or two. Once they're big enough, they become smolts meaning that their bodies start changing to prepare them for a life at sea. They migrate out from the river through Puget Sound and to the ocean where they'll spend a few years growing and maturing before they return to lay eggs of their own. What our work is showing that even though the journey through Puget Sound is a very short part of a steelhead's life, many steelhead don't survive this journey. The marine survival rate of Puget Sound steelhead has declined over the past several decades and we're now learning that early marine mortality, mortality while the fish are within our Puget Sound waters, may be one of the reasons why that decline happened and why these populations are struggling to recover. Along with our many partners on the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project, we've been studying the factors that affect juvenile steelhead and other salmon in the Salish Sea. One of the key tools that we use to study steelhead is telemetry or tracking. We catch juvenile fish like this one on the way out of the river, anesthetize them, and surgically implant a tiny tag into their belly. That tag emits a unique code that is then detected by these arrays of receivers that we've deployed throughout Puget Sound. So we can see using this technique where the fish goes and whether it makes it all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. Let's look at an example of the information that we gain from this type of work. We're gonna start here and just orient ourselves to this blank plot. The X axis down here at the bottom is labeled distance from JDF line. And what that means is distance from the Juan de Fuca receiver line, the line in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, just off the left side of this map here, that marks a fish's entrance to the Pacific Ocean. So we can think about this far right of the plot as a kind of finish line for a fish's journey from river mouth all the way to the ocean. On the y-axis, we have survival probability. So the chance that a fish survives to any given point in its migration. Let's look at two Hood Canal populations. Steelhead from the Skokomish River down here in South Hood Canal, a little bit over 200 kilometers away from the Wanda Fuqua line, and a little steelhead from Big Beef Creek, which are just over 150 kilometers away from the Juan de Fuca line or the Pacific Ocean. Our little steelhead leave the rivers and they swim through Hood Canal. And then we detect the survivors at the next receiver line. So based on that, we can say that these fish have really good chances of surviving Hood, Hood Canal, somewhere around 80% chance of survival through that migration segment. But then, when we look at the next migration segment, the one that includes the Hood Canal Bridge and heading into Admiralty Inlet, we see this big drop in survival probabilities down to under 50% by this point. 
We've done more intensive research showing that most of that mortality happens right there at the bridge itself. And we'll come back to that later in more detail. For now, let's finish our journey to the Pacific Ocean. And when we look across that full migration, we see that the overall chances of survival through the full migration are very low. Our little fish leaving Big Reef Creek, for example, only had a 10% chance of surviving the 150 kilometers that he traveled to the ocean. We can look at other steelhead populations around Puget Sound using the same technique, and we find that all of these populations have overall really low survival chances of getting through the Puget Sound environment. Survival rates as low as these have been shown in other studies that when it happens this early in the ocean life stage, it can prevent population growth and recovery overall. So what's killing juvenile steelhead? Well, first, let's take a minute to brainstorm. Go ahead and pause this video and take some time to think about what could kill a fish. Write down a list of your ideas. Okay, do you have your list? Let's review what we know and find some clues that can help us evaluate these ideas. First, we know based on those tagging data that these fish are only spending a week or two in Puget Sound waters and that a lot of the mortality for many populations happens pretty early in that time frame. So we know that whatever's killing juvenile steelhead has to act fast. This means it's probably not a slow acting agent of mortality like starvation. Next, we know that mortality is happening during migration, this April to June, where juvenile fish that are about five and a half to 10 inches long are moving from river mouth to the ocean. So it's probably not something like fishing. Commercial, tribal, and recreational fishers just aren't out there trying to catch these hand-sized little fish. And finally, we know that when these fish out migrate, they stick pretty close to the surface of the water and they're not really tied to the shoreline. So we need an agent of mortality that fits that profile. Take a second look at your list and see what ideas fit or don't fit. What meets these criteria? Take another brief pause here if you need to and come back to the video when you're ready. Researchers on the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project went through a process just like this, developing ideas or hypotheses and evaluating the evidence for and against each idea. They found that the most likely direct source of mortality is predation. But there are a lot of potential predators out there in our Puget Sound food web. So how do we know which predators are eating steelhead? Well, we can narrow down the list of potential predators just like we narrowed down our mortality hypotheses. We're looking for predators that feed in the Salish Sea, that are abundant during the out-migration season, and that eat fish the size of a steelhead. Lots of birds and marine mammal species meet one or two of this criteria, these criteria, but when we look for the sweet spot, the predators that meet all three of those criteria, this narrows the field considerably. And we're left with these candidate predators, harbor seals, Caspian terns, double crested and branched cormorants, harbor porpoises, California sea lions, and common murres. Of these candidates, only two, the harbor seals and the harbor porpoise have increased substantially in abundance in Puget Sound over the period of steelhead decline and are present throughout the steelhead out migration period. Harbor porpoise can eat fish roughly the size of juvenile steelhead, but there aren't actually records of them eating steelhead in Puget Sound. So there are potential that we can't rule out at this point, but the most likely source of predation for steelhead given the evidence overall is harbor seals. Harbor seal abundance has increased sevenfold in the Salish Sea since receiving protection under the Federal Marine Mammal Protection Act in 1972. And diet analyses over the past several years have shown that seals in Puget Sound do sometimes eat juvenile steelhead. While steelhead are a minor component of seal diets, the high abundance of seals and the amount of fish that they need to eat can result in a large impact, especially since steelhead populations are now much less abundant than they once were. Other evidence that we've collected through our work and our partners work on the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project and Hood Canal Bridge Assessment supports the hypothesis that harbor seal predation is an important source of early mortality for steelhead. I wanna highlight two case studies in specific locations in Puget Sound to show you this evidence. The first is at the Hood Canal Bridge, which 
if you remember those survival plots from earlier, was associated with a really big drop in survival. The Hood Canal Bridge is a floating bridge. It has pontoons that extend about 15 feet down into the water column. We deployed depth sensitive tags in Hood Canal Steelhead to better understand how they navigated the bridge. So over here on the Y axis, we have depth in the water column. And over here on the X axis, we have date time. So it's just a fish traveling through the water column. Here's an example of typical steelhead behavior. They're very surface oriented. They stay right at the top of the water column with a shallow dive right here at the end. This is where the fish navigated underneath the bridge and came back up to the surface. But some tags in this study showed very different behavior. They started out in the fish at the surface and when a predator ate the fish, the tag kept transmitting from within the predator's stomach. With this tag, you can see that this predator was making repeated shallow and deep dives over a period of hours while the tag was in its stomach. The next year, we also added temperature sensitive tags into this study and the fish with temperature sensitive tags that got eaten showed an elevated temperature profile. These dive and temperature patterns are consistent with harbor seal predation at the Hood Canal Bridge. Another series of tagging experiments on juvenile steelhead coming out of the Nisqually River also support the harbor seal predation hypothesis. Here we are in South Puget Sound. So Seattle's up here, Central Puget Sound here, and South Puget Sound here. Let's go on a little bit closer in. South Puget Sound there, closer still. Now we're right at the mouth of the river. In this tag data set, researchers found that some tags weren't leaving the river and heading out for the ocean like a typical steelhead would. Instead, they were moving back and forth between the estuary and the river with the tide. This is actually a harbor seal behavior. Our partners at Nisqually Indian Tribe have observed harbor seals moving into the river with the high tide and moving out again as the tide falls. Last year, we deployed temperature sensitive tags in these fish. And like we saw at the bridge, the tags that got eaten showed elevated temperature profiles. Again, consistent with seal predation. So far, the story seems pretty clear, right? Seals probably aren't the only steelhead predator out there, but the evidence we have suggests that they are an important source of mortality for these fish. But we can't stop there. To fit the final puzzle piece in, we need to understand the underlying factors that affect predation. That's a lot harder and it makes the story more complicated but it also gives us the best chance of recovering steelhead populations within an ecosystem context. It lets us see what's really going on and what we can do about it. So let's take another pause here for brainstorming. What do you think could affect predation? What might make a fish more or less likely to be eaten by a predator? Try revisiting your original list of mortality sources to help you think of ideas. Well, one important factor that we've touched on already is location. When we can identify specific locations of disproportionately high mortality, like the Hood Canal Bridge and the Nisqually Estuary, we can start to understand what's driving predation at these locations. Studies that our partners have done on Steelhead and Strait of Georgia suggest that migration route can have large effects on survival probability. So continued tagging and tracking to identify these pinch points and the reasons they lead to mortality is important at a population level. Another important underlying factor that I bet many of you came up with already is the health of the juvenile steelhead. It's unlikely that contaminants, parasites, or disease are directly causing fish to die during a one to two week out migration, but fish that are sick or compromised by contaminants or parasites may be more vulnerable to predators they may be less able to detect a predator's presence or to escape the predator, or they might engage in more risky behavior that exposes them to predators. This raises a broader fundamental question about the nature of predation in Puget Sound for these fish, the possibility that seal predation might represent in some part compensatory mortality, meaning that seals might be eating fish that would have died anyway. Given the complexity of ecosystems, it's very difficult to distinguish whether that's the case, but it's an important thing to keep in mind 
when we consider potential actions to recover steelhead. And it's also important to understand the effects of disease and contaminants can increase as our human population grows and as the climate changes. One final underlying factor I wanna to touch on today is the status of other fish populations in Puget Sound and how changes in fish populations can cause shifts in predators' behaviors. Harbor seals don't typically target juvenile steelhead. In Puget Sound, they actually mostly eat gadids like hake and clupeids like herring. But if these types of prey aren't available, they may shift their feeding to whatever prey is available. We have some evidence through the Sailor Sea Marine Survival Project that supports this prey switching hypothesis. So let's take a trip back to the Nisqually River where our partners at NOAA have been tagging wild juvenile steelhead since 2006. Here on the x-axis, we have every year that we've tagged fish in our time series. And on the y-axis, we're once again looking at survival probabilities. We see really low early marine survival in this first period of tagging. And then in 2016 and 2017, we saw a big increase. More fish were surviving through Puget Sound. In fact, nearly 40% of juveniles survived to the ocean that, in those years. So what happened? Well, it turns out waters in Puget Sound were warmer beginning in 2015, and this supported a big boom of anchovies in Puget Sound. Anchovies are small, silvery forage fish like herring. They're also warm water spawners that are only present within Puget Sound when the water conditions are right for them. Check out this correlation between anchovy abundance and survival rate. What you're seeing here is that when anchovy abundance is higher, juvenile steelhead survival is also higher. This supports the hypothesis that when alternate prey populations are available, predators will eat fewer juvenile steelhead. All right, so now we have a pretty good picture of why predation matters for juvenile steelhead who the most likely predators are, and what underlying factors might be influencing predation. So what can we do about it? Well, first, at pinch points like the Hood Canal Bridge, where we've identified the ways that this infrastructure leads to predation and high mortality, we can implement direct solutions. So for example, in this case, modifying the infrastructure to reduce predator access to the fish and allowing the fish to escape predators and pass the bridge safely. We can also support other fish populations, for example, by working to restore spawning habitat for herring and increasing herring abundance. And finally, there's an ongoing need for in-river habitat restoration. Actions like reducing the amounts of contaminants entering our streams through wastewater and stormwater sources, addressing parasite and disease issues, and restoring native vegetation. Healthy rivers produce healthy fish, and healthy fish likely have better odds of survival in Puget Sound and in the ocean environment. And habitat restoration actions like these benefit not only steelhead, but also all the other salmon and trout species that rely on Puget Sound rivers. That's all the time we have for today, but we have lots more data to share and some really cool projects going on. So to learn more and keep up to date with our work, find us on social media or check out our website, www.lltk.org. Thanks for listening.